make God? Why do elephants have a trunk? God, what's your favorite color? And why um, do hot dogs, um, like, like, are going hot dogs, maybe because I look like a hot dog? Mm -hmm. Do you like Minecraft? What is your favorite animal? Why was popcorn made? What is your favorite movie and why is it Star Wars? I have a confession. A couple weeks ago, I told you that every question uh, the kids came up with themselves, and that's been true up until the last one I planted that one. So, sorry. <laughs> Do you remember the first time you had your heart broken? I remember the first time it really happened to me. Uh, I was probably 14, and I had a girlfriend at school, whatever that was. And man, I thought she was awesome because we liked the same music and she had these cool Converse sneakers that she would doodle on. We talked all the time on Instant Messenger. We'd been together about six months, which is an eternity for 14-year-olds. Uh, and then we found out that her family was moving. So at lunch, towards the end of the school year, she came up to me and she broke up with me. Yeah. Yeah. That's where y'all go, oh, sorry. Thank, thank you. That was really sweet. And I still remember like what a mess I was that day. So it was lunchtime and there were more classes to go to, but I, we lived close to the school, so I just walked home. I'm done. I remember stomping up the stairs of my apartment, flinging the door home, the door of my home just wide open, and I started sobbing. And my mom was there, and she stopped whatever she was doing. She came over, and she hugged me, and she gave me ice cream or corn dogs or whatever 14-year-old boys eat. I don't remember. And I can't imagine what my mom was thinking. I mean, okay, I was 14. We knew this probably wasn't going to work out. She was moving away. And in the grand scheme of things, this is not a big deal. But I blubbered, and I asked why. My mom comforted me. Now, teenage heartbreak is painful, especially when you are the teenager going through it. But it's nothing like some of the pain and suffering that we see in our world all the time. Each and every one of us experiences real pain and real suffering in our lives. So that's what we're taking up today. This series, uh, Ronnie and I have worked through this book, and it's Questions Christians Hope no one will ask them because they're tough. But these are questions that people ask us anyway. They're important. And we have to know what we think about them. So this is a big one today. Pain, suffering, that four-letter word called evil. We're going to address it. Now, when I was in college, I studied philosophy. And one of the reasons for that Besides all the incredible employment opportunities you get with an undergraduate degree in philosophy, there's no jobs for that. Um, despite that, I wanted to wrestle with this question, why is there suffering in the world? And it comes up to us today in many different forms. We hear it all the time. Why do bad things happen to good people? How can a God allow pain and suffering in our world? Couldn't he just stop earthquakes and murders, and war, and disease, so we wouldn't have to all go through this. It's only been a week since the tragic earthquake in Nepal, and this morning I saw that the death count has reached over 7,000. Today, with technology, we have quick access to see all over the world and see the terrible things happening, and so does everybody else. So how do we as Christians respond to this problem? This question, in fact, is generally considered to be the number one reason why people doubt God. Number one. And how we respond to it is so important to the lives of those we meet who are struggling with it. In fact, it's important to us because at some time or another, we too will wrestle with this question of why. So we're diving in today into this familiar territory of pain and suffering, and we're going to see how we as Christians can address it. So classically, the problem breaks down like this. We believe that God is good, 
And we believe that God is all-powerful, and yet there's evil in our world. It might seem like these three together can't be true. If God is all-powerful and good, why evil? This question has puzzled many throughout history. And one of those was a professor and an atheist who, he was so outraged by the problem, he set out to disprove Christianity once and for all. And in his study of Scripture and theology, he met Jesus Christ, and his life was transformed. You've probably heard of him. He's the author of Narnia, one of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century, C.S. Lewis. He wrestled not only with the problem of evil, but also the problem of good. If all this existence is by chance and there's no point, why do we find beauty and joy and laughter and hope? Listen to what he records. My argument against God was that the universe just seems so cruel and unjust. But how had I gotten this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? If the whole show was bad and senseless from A to Z, so to speak, why did I, who was supposed to be part of the show, find myself in such violent reaction against it. If the whole universe has no meaning, we should never have found out that it has no meaning. Just as if there was no light in the universe, there would be no creatures with eyes, and they would never know it was dark. Dark would be without meaning. See, for Lewis, even the acknowledgement of evil points to something within us that longs for an existence without evil at all. It longs for a world that has no more suffering. It's as if we have been created in the very image of a good and just God. So that's Lewis' answer, and it's a helpful way to understand the problem. But there's lots of other responses that have been given. And before we get into those, I want to make this perfectly clear. We don't get to know everything. And this sermon, as hard as I might try, cannot explain evil away. Sorry. No one's been able to do it. See, we're confined to space and time and a finite mind and existence. And if our God is as great as he says he is, we better not be able to understand everything about him or his creation. That's why he's God. We aren't. But there are things we understand. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting with verse 12, Paul says this, For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these is love. That's Paul saying that we only get to see part of the story. And the part that we get to see that's been revealed to us most clearly, is God's love. You know what it's like to drive in a really thick fog? Right after I got my license for the first time, I took some friends and we went to the movies. And while we were at the movies, it got dark and it got really foggy. So we came out and I had to drive them home. And we went out on the highway and I could barely see anything and I was scared. But you know, you can see the lights coming the other way from other cars. And right in front of you, you can see those taillights of the car you're that's right in front of you. So you, you hone in on that. You follow those lights. Sometimes when we swim in these big mysteries, these big tough questions, it can be a lot like that. We can't see or know everything. Not now. But we can see a glimpse of things. Bits of light that let us know where we are and where to go. Bits of light that remind us we aren't totally in the dark. Bits of light that remind us we're created to see light. So what are some of these things we can get a hold of? First, we know that God is not the author of evil. God is love. Scripture tells us and evil is the very opposite of that. 1 John 1.5 says this, This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Sin entered the world through the choices of humanity. 
And the broken world we live in is still being impacted both by the potential for evil and pride that exists in each one of us and the real cosmic forces of evil that Scripture describes. But see what God is. In Psalm 86, 15. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundance and loving kindness and truth. Another light that we can see is that we're free. And because we are free creatures, we choose things. We can choose the alternative to loving God. In concentration camps in Nazi Germany, the guards could force their prisoners to do almost anything, but they could never force their prisoners to love them. Because for love to be love, it must be a choice. And so, there has to be an alternative to that choice. Sin, selfishness, pride. Thinking that we can be God. That we can be the ones who call all the shots. There's another light we see. And we find it in Romans 5, 3-4. through 4. It says this, And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. We see that suffering can produce character and strength. We can grow from it. Desmond Tutu, a social activist, bishop, and combatant of apartheid in South Africa, he put together a reconciliation commission. And when he was selecting people, he chose victims of violence who had chosen to forgive their oppressors. And these people became the wounded healers of South Africa. Out of terrible suffering through forgiveness, they changed their country. We know that suffering can produce character, but often when we're in the thick of suffering, that's not all that helpful to hear. And it's often misunderstood. God is not lobbing suffering at you just to make you tougher, okay? No, instead, He takes the evil that befalls us and He transforms it, redeems it for good. God can and does take the negative turns of our life and use them for good, but they're still negative turns. What we find is that God is not the author of evil, but that God is in the business of setting things to right. This, a bright light in the fog. Two weeks ago, we talked about God creating things in Genesis and deeming them good. Today, we're going to see another glimpse of of good at the end of the Bible. If you'll turn to Revelation 21, we're going to read verses 1 through 4. Here we get an image of the future world, the final world that God promises to bring to us. In verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them. They shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And hear this, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. First things have passed away. As I've read this passage many times, uh, I used to wonder like, hey, why are you getting rid of the sea? That's really strange. I kind of like the sea. I own a kayak. It's fun. So why did you do that? But in Jewish literature, the sea was always a symbol for chaos, for death, 
for unpredictable calamity. If you were an ancient people, you could be wiped out by floods at any time. You could find drought and have nothing. You would go on a journey on the sea and not know if you were going to make it. God is bringing forth a new earth with no chaos where God and humanity will dwell together again. There will be no tears, no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain. And now we live somewhere after Easter and before the final coming of Christ. So here we are in the middle, along the way, knowing that God is victorious and He is setting things to right But we aren't at the finished product yet. But we will be. See, since the fall of humanity in Genesis 3, we find that the Scriptures are telling the story of how God is at work with His boots on the ground setting things to rights through the nation of Israel and the person of Jesus Christ. God declared to Abraham, you will be a blessing to all nations, a light to the world. Now, Israel struggles to deliver on this responsibility, but over and over again, God acts to free them, to save them, to preserve them, to set the world back to right, to do something about evil. And this acting against evil, it continues and takes us to perhaps the clearest light of all when we see the beaten and bruised face of Jesus Christ who lived and died to save us, to do something final about evil in our world. In the book of Philippians, if you'll turn there, Paul's writing in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. He's writing to this church that he loved. He says this, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus who although he existed in the form of God, the nature of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, to take an advantage of. But he emptied himself, poured himself out, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death, On a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here we find the real blueprint with how to deal with suffering. We find the answers to these questions much less in words, but in the action of Jesus and his followers. You see, God does not drive back all the fog and let us see everything. Instead, he came to earth as a man and suffered too, right alongside us. And as you go through suffering, you cannot control. You can look to a God who voluntarily took on suffering himself deliver you. Here we find a God who does not tell us everything we might want to know about suffering. Instead, he rolls up his sleeves and he gets to work fixing the problem, even to the point of taking the burden of sin and evil on his shoulders himself. As we come upon hard times, we can look to a God who acted in the most dramatic and ultimate way to deliver us. So what do we as Christians do when we hear from the hurting? Well, Paul makes it pretty clear in Philippians. He says, have the same attitude, the same mind as Christ. To share his thoughts, his will, his desire. That means to let go of ourselves, to pour ourselves out and do what? Here we have God who stooped down from the glories of heaven, who made himself nothing, was obedient even to the point of death. He took the form of a servant, was beaten and mocked and killed for us to deliver us. And we as his image bearers, as Christians, were called to have the same mind 
the same attitude. So even when things are good and we aren't suffering, we're called to stoop down and to share the suffering of those around us, to advocate for them. When I was young and I had a broken heart, I just needed some comfort. And today when people suffer, they still need comfort. And people who have been hurt and not found that comfort, they're quick to blame God. But maybe sometimes they aren't comforted because we, God's people, did not have the same mind of Christ. We didn't suffer alongside with them, pick them up, encourage them. See, when we say that God doesn't do anything about suffering, we're just flat out wrong because God already did something about suffering. He took it upon himself. He suffered for us and he invites us to his kingdom that will be free from pain. See, Scripture does not give us an explanation of suffering. Instead, it tells us the account of God who actively did something about it. So people can blame God for suffering if they want. But when they do, they will find that God has already served the sentence for all the evil in the world. When we hear this question today, we remember that God has acted and he calls us to act as well. He calls us to comfort, to pray, to lift each other up, to take on each other's burdens in a community. We have to live out the claims of the Lord's prayer that we would forgive others as we've been forgiven, as God's kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's why we see this beautiful thing called the church. We can minister to each other. We can comfort each other. When someone is struggling, we can be there for them. And we take encouragement together that the enemy is defeated and we await a final deliverance. Here we see God and his great love. and He's acted against suffering. He hates evil more than we do. And he is at work setting the world to right. And we are dared to imagine what living in God's kingdom is like and dared to live in the right now as if we're a part of it, to comfort, to love, to humble ourselves, to live as a servant, to have the same attitude as Christ. My challenge this week for you is to demonstrate this love of Christ in a tangible way to someone who might be suffering, who might be dealing with pain, to love them. As one writer puts it, yes, evil is a four-letter word, but so thanks be to God is love. If you'll pray with me. God, we thank you that though there is evil in the world, we trust in the God who did something about it who promises to deliver us, who has delivered us and invites us to his kingdom while there'll be no more pain or death or mourning or crying. Father, we ask that we at this church could aspire to be like the church in Philippians, to have the same mind and attitude as Christ, to humble ourselves and to suffer alongside one another, joyfully looking towards hope, to encourage one another to be a light in the fog for those who are lost. God, we thank you that you did something. We pray for those who have questions about this, who are dealing with pain, who are suffering. We pray for your encouragement and your hope. We pray that you will gather a community around them For those who want to know more about who this Jesus is, I pray you would speak to them, that they would go to the connection point after if they want to talk or pray. Encourage them to do that. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our suffering Savior, came down to earth for us, defeated death and rose again. Jesus, our Lord, we pray, amen.